Welcome back guys to episode 70 of the JPS podcast and in this episode very honored to have Dr. Eric Helms on the show and we're going to be discussing a topic that is very important to anyone who's looking to diet down to extremely low levels of body fat and the topic we are discussing is global fatigue management for contest prep athletes. Now, as you might know, fatigue is a very serious consequence of stressing the body and we need to know what to measure, know how to manage it, and be armed with the tools and strategies to ensure that it doesn't compromise the contest prep. And this is a topic Eric will be speaking on at the Ultimate Evidence-Based Conference here in Melbourne in June, the 28th to the 30th. So if you guys come down to the conference, You'll also be able to see Dr. Mike Isratel, Marta McDonald, Jeff Nippard, James Krieger, Menno Henselmans, Danny Lennon, Brian Miner, Gab Fundaro, and James Hoffman. So we've got an absolutely stacked lineup, and Eric will be discussing global fatigue management strategies for contest prep. So in this episode, we talk about global fatigue and how we can define that. We also discuss why fatigue can lead to a failed prep and some important concepts such as allostatic load and stress tolerance. And then we look at diet and tracking induced fatigue. So how the deficit, fat mass reductions and the tracking strategies and assessment methods that we use may induce more stress than we realize. And we also look at the effects of hypochloric dieting on recovering fatigue in a very general sense, as well as the strategies athletes can employ to manage that fatigue. If you enjoy this episode of the podcast, without further ado, Dr. Eric Helms. Welcome back, guys, to the JPS podcast, and we have Dr. Helms back on the show. Welcome, Eric. Thank you for having me. Glad to be here, man. Not a problem, man. And for those of you who aren't aware, Eric is currently prepping. He has competed in his first show just two weeks ago, I believe, in Hawaii, and he is... Yeah, killing it, brought his best physique to the stage to date, and he's got a few more shows lined up. And we're going to be talking about global fatigue management for contest prep, which is Eric's topic at the UEBC. So we're going to be looking at what that all means and how Eric has applied this concept and some of the strategies that you can use to manage fatigue during uh, semi-starvation and the deep and dark places we get in a contest prep and hopefully help many of you guys who are athletes or coaches. So Eric, let's uh, talk about global fatigue management. It sounds like a very, uh, yeah, intriguing topic. And I guess uh, what I like to do with these kind of things is break down and define each of the terms. So what are we talking about when we say global fatigue management? I presume it's uh, very different to local or specific fatigue management. Focus. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So um, I think it's good to start with the backdrop of why do most preps fail and then what does failure mean? Um, so failure in the context of most preps, um, people either define it as I didn't get into the kind of shape I wanted or I never even got on stage. And while those are distinctly different, not getting into the shape you want or not getting on stage, many of the times they have the same cause. And that often comes down to not being able to stick to the diet and adhere to it. Um, Sometimes it's just not giving yourself enough time. But even when you do everything right, some people just don't get into shape or even when you plan everything right. And it's because the diet fatigue is too high, so they can't sustain the appropriate deficit for a long enough or a high enough deficit to to get into shape uh, or their body starts beating them back to the point where it affects their mind and then they get in their own way psychologically. Um, and that basically comes down to the fact that, um, fatigue and stress are, are, you know, that they are global, even when you experience it, uh, from a specific part of prep, whether that's your cardio is beating you up or your training or your nutrition. Um, it's all experienced through, uh, you know, the lens of being a human, right. And, uh, your total quote unquote all- allostatic load, So when I say global fatigue management, we're talking about how do we make prep feel easier without sacrificing uh, the the actual process of making it efficient and effective so that you can hang in with uh, 
more aggressive diets or longer diets or longer, more aggressive diets or whatever you need to do to get on stage, uh, a, and then B getting on stage in the kind of condition that you need to be, to be competitive these days. Um, because it is typically not a question or a head scratching moment of what do I have to do to actually get shredded? It's, it's more of how do I stay in the pocket and keep dieting and keep pushing and keep going until I am shredded uh, and do what is needed to be done despite the demands of life and the demands of prep. So that's essentially what we're talking about to define our terms. Yeah, fantastic. And I've definitely seen this play out uh, with athletes that I've worked with who just haven't been able to manage all of the stress that comes with contest prep, uh, potentially didn't prepare themselves or treat it seriously enough because I think people... Uh, when they're new to bodybuilding, they just don't, they, they really underestimate what it's all about and just how much uh, it can really take over. And that was definitely the case for me uh, last year uh, when I prepped, well, tried to prep, didn't get stage. It was just stress was too high. Uh, I didn't prevent stress enough um, and couldn't manage it accordingly when it uh, came about. But a uh, term that you used that I think uh, we should probably discuss a little bit more was allostatic load. And I guess, why is this term uh, important in the concept of managing fatigue and how does that uh, influence our ability to tolerate uh, various amounts of stress and how does that change in a contest prep? Sure. So allostatic load means the, the total stress that your entire system is taking, essentially. Um, and I think it's important that uh, we not act too reductionist in the way we look at physiology and psychology, which is our tendency. That's kind of the roots of if you look at, you know, anatomy and, and Western medicine and, and just the, the, the basic way that the scientific method is applied in quantitative methods is to separate variables, isolate them and see what causes what. Um, now, that's that's a method that is useful, but that's not actually the way we operate as humans, you know. Um, like the, the biopsychosocial model is, is, is a new term that you'll hear. Mm. And that basically means that your biology affects your psychology, affects your interactions sociologically, and round and round and round. So uh, there, there is less separation than uh, we, 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 we discuss physiology and psychology, more so physiology, uh, and then what we do about it in a way that implies a level of separation that simply isn't there. Uh, one of my mentors, when I was studying, uh, said to me repeatedly, stress is stress is stress. Um, and they, and this, this is a part of the reason why I studied autoregulation in my PhD is that, um, you know, we, we like to assume that what is on the spreadsheet, uh, is, is are, are the variables that are going to impact our outcomes. And then we get very frustrated as coaches when that seems not to be the case. And we have data showing, uh, for example, uh, that, that students during exams uh, gain less strength than students who are not studying. We have uh, data showing that the more negative life experiences you report on a subjective questionnaire, the slower you gain strength. Um, we know various things that are we can easily put into categories negatively affect uh, strength and body composition, like sleep, uh, like nutrition. Um, but... The reality is that anything that could cause a certain level of stress and elevate your allostatic load can have a measurable impact on your, your ability to progress. So if you are, let's say, uh, a new father with a couple kids and a business owner who's trying to put on multiple seminars every year and do a contest prep, man, that might be something that is a level of insurmountable challenge that you couldn't have anticipated. Um, and... So understanding how you can reduce the experience of all those stresses is very important. Uh, and then having strategies in place that allow you to adapt to those stresses is very important. Sometimes that means, like you said, taking a prep more seriously and being more quantitative, tracking things uh, and making sure that your hand is on the steering wheel. Sometimes, though, if those behaviors aren't ingrained and if learning to track and, and changing your nutrition. And if like say first time competitors, one of the biggest things is this is often the first time they've ever changed their entire lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Um, and the, 
not only is the the process of being in a deficit and losing body fat creating stress, but the behaviors they have to follow to achieve that create stress. And we actually have data on that. There's a, a cool study where cortisol rises independently as a response to being an energy deficit. However, subjective stress is reported higher by tracking to get you into an energy deficit mm -hmm. because even the group that tracked that wasn't an energy deficit reported higher levels of stress. Uh, that might not be true in an experienced competitor who has certain behaviors ingrained in the off season, but a first time competitor or someone who's kind of gotten away from certain behaviors because they've had major life shifts like a new business or new or, or a family or et cetera. Um, those are additional things. So by trying to manage variables, we have to acknowledge when we're actually making the problem potentially worse and then what level and degree of control is appropriate for what competitors at what stage of their career and at what stage of prep. And, you know, essentially sometimes the, the question is what's the minimum amount of changes we can, we can make to get the most change, uh, which is often counterintuitive for the bodybuilder whose natural uh, mental tendency is to control everything because that's quote unquote optimal. And then forgetting that the, the task of controlling things actually cre mm -hmm. creates stress in and of itself or can depending on their experience level and what they're, what they're habituated to. Very interesting, very interesting. So I guess what's important is the distinction between psychological stress and then training related stress. And I'm not sure that looking at the, the topic of global fatigue management, many people would have been able to discern that the stress that we experience outside of the gym impacts the contest prep just as much, if not more, as the, the training related stress. So what are some of the types of strategies or variables we need to be monitoring in terms of the uh, non-training related stresses that athletes can help themselves or coaches can help their athletes uh, manage that uh, fatigue? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, I think the first thing to realize is um, what are, what are the, so the, like when I do this presentation in the, at, the, at the UEBC, I'll be first helping everyone understand where are all the sources of stress and what happens during contest prep. Um, because we don't even fully understand as a, as a community, I would say. I think there's enough scientific data that we have a basic understanding uh, the sources of all these stresses and why they occur. Like if I was to ask a room full of bodybuilders, uh, is dieting hard because you because you get really lean? or because of what you have to do to get lean. Um, I think the savvy people would probably say both. Mm -hmm. um, some people wouldn't be sure of the difference. You know, we kind of correlate what I, what I look like with what I experience. And you'll often hear the old adage in bodybuilding is that the person who feels the worst on stage um, is probably going to have the best chance of winning. I've heard that repeated so many times. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the, I, I don't think that's necessarily true, but it can be. Uh, at least at times, hopefully not actually on stage. Yeah, when, I was going to say. In my I opinion, think... you should be drinking water and eating food. That's yeah. kind of an old school thing. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, the the process of getting to incredibly lean um, Dick skin for most lane. people, yeah, exactly. <laughs> for most people, is going to really, really feel awful at some point. Um, so understanding that there are sources of stress from the the deficit itself, but not just the deficit, but the energy availability, mm -hmm. um, which is how you achieve that deficit, how long you're in that deficit, how large that energy gap is relative to what you need to maintain all your body processes. And that while we don't fully understand the aspect of being lean in and of itself, it does seem that the leaner you get modifies how beat up you get from having low energy availability. Um, so it's this ever increasing, um, stress level as you, as you get tighter and tighter and tighter. So a lot of the things that I've talked about in previous presentations have, have to do with nonlinear dieting, diet breaks, refeeds, um, you know, auto regulation, uh, you know, taking more deloads, uh, managing failure, uh, thinking about different exercise splits, et cetera. There's a lot that I'm going to be talking about there as far as mm -hmm. how you're going to manipulate your training and nutrition. But I think there's also a large discussion to be had around um, what's the appropriate tracking and monitoring method for you at different times. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so, for example, I think the many of the folks who engage with with my information or who I've competed alongside, or even myself just a couple seasons ago, would be wanting to hit their protein, carbs, and fat within five grams from week one of prep until the end, because that's that's optimal. Um, but if I really sat down with myself and asked the question and said, hey, do you actually think that hitting 60 grams of fat um, instead of 80 and uh, 245 grams of carbs instead of 200, even though those have the same amount of calories if you flip, flip the two, in week one of prep, when you're going from 18% body fat down to 16, makes any difference at all? And I would probably have to say no, based on everything that we know and my own subjective experience. Um, so why are you tracking it and does it help you? Um, can we just do calories and protein? Mm-hmm. Um, and then even like you know, if we're talking about someone who's a highly experienced competitor, do you need to put it on the scale and weigh it if you have the same eating behaviors off-season and in-season and it might just be swapping food out? How do we make the least amount of decisions and have our attention split to the least amount of places and get things done. Um, and also, tracking should be done in a way that is facilitative, not debilitative. So what I think many competitors do is that they will track everything to the exclusion of paying attention to their body signals. And there's actually research showing that some bodybuilders have less body awareness about how they're feeling than other exercisers Mm -hmm. because your average exerciser who's not you know a bodybuilder trying to control and manage everything um assesses things qualitatively more often which fosters an awareness of how hungry am i how do i feel oh should i eat a little before before i training uh should i stop here should i do this and it's very easy for bodybuilders to write this off as not being dedicated and that if i'm dedicated i'm going to optimize everything but when using tracking in such a way that it actually supplants your awareness of, let's say, satiety, uh, hunger, uh, even body awareness for injuries, things like that, that is debilitative. They can be used in conjunction. It's not a zero-sum game. It's not a dichotomy. It's not, I don't want to present a, a false, mm-hmm. false dichotomy here, that you can track and then be aware of your satiety and hunger and think, man, You know, I've been hitting 1,800 calories every day, but I am extremely hungry today. What's going on? Oh, that's right. I I was super active today. Um, I should probably eat more. I'm I'm intending to have a 500-calorie deficit based on what I wrote down on paper, but I'm probably in a larger deficit, and all my internal signals are telling me that. Um, And then eat more, you know. But I think what most bodybuilders do is they chain themselves to a number, and they put solace and faith, which it is faith, um, when, when you make a decision and don't change it no matter what, not science, um, to, to adhere to something even though you have evidence that perhaps you should do something else. Now, that's, hard, that's a hard decision to make when you're a first-time competitor to go, right, I'm going to eat another 400 calories. Because you've never done it before. You don't know what to expect. You haven't seen uh, – you don't even have the experience to correlate your qualitative subjective assessment with quantitative outcomes. Um, so, Because I'm not saying let go of tracking. Like, for example, what I'm doing currently is I'm weighing in on a regular basis and I'm, I've got a certain target rate of weight loss and I'm also assessing my physique and I'm actually having Berto look at that, you know, and sending him videos, um, watching my own videos, not just checking in the mirror and doing things to get that kind of objective eye of am I progressing. But then I feed that back in and I do, uh, I'll, I'll take impromptu refeeds. I will eat more calories or less calories if I've been a full-blown desk jockey the whole day, uh, and alter the plan. So I'm tracking, but the only input is not tracking and and hitting hitting numbers on a spreadsheet. I'm modifying the plan based on other feedback. Now that could be, if I told a novice to do that, that would be more decisions. That would be uh, debilitative. But if I told someone who's been very experienced to do it, uh, that might be actually very helpful and unlock uh, unlock their ability to get to a, a new level of of uh, displaying more muscle and being leaner on stage. Uh, to put it to put it simply, S- assuming they've actually fostered those skills, because sometimes it'll just be years and years and years of I hit these numbers, this works. I'm going to repeat it, and I'm I'm I'm, I'm praying to the quantitative god and and paying not paying attention to any of my own signals. 
So yeah, I think you do have to start fostering some of those uh, body awarenesses over time if you want to go to the next level as a bodybuilder and start really customizing your own prep, if you will, in off season. Yeah, I think that's extremely important. And there's so many things there that listeners will find beneficial. But more importantly, I think the fact that the body is such a dynamic organism and it's not simply a matter of I've got this arbitrary number, I've got to hit that and it's all said and done. Um, you know, there are so many changes within hours, days that we, we can, if we are aware and have an understanding like you do, um, be very reactive with our diet as we are our training. It's uh, mm-hmm. auto-regulating nutrition, right? Um, and I did the exact same thing with my prep. I barely tracked for the first, I think it was like eight weeks lost like five kgs because I was just trying to save mental juices uh, for, for down the track when I needed it as opposed to yeah coming out of the gate too hard too early and running out of gas but it didn't matter in the end but yeah I think that's a really good way to go about prep modulating the tracking method um, and tightening the reins when necessary as well as uh, pulling back but outside of the I guess diet and tracking induced fatigue what are some of the other uh, non-training related stresses we need to, to manage? Because that's just one of them. I guess, mm-hmm. like you mentioned, the tracking and how focused we are on quantitative uh, data versus the qualitative subjective stuff, that'll be highly dependent on an individual's personality type as well. Somebody who's you know, very conscientious, super neurotic, they're going to thrive on the numbers. So you know, deviating from the numbers could be problematic. Um, but in the same vein, some people are going to be, you know, high in extroversion, pre-contest prep. Uh, they're going to be the person who gets a lot of energy from people. And as we're discussing off air, you're really trying to manage the time where you have social interactions. And, and that can be stressful as well, knowing that uh, you're just not able to, you know, be your normal self and, you know, go out there and be intimate with, you know, loved ones, have conversations uh, you know, on a regular basis that you would otherwise have. So that can be stressful. Uh, do you want to speak to that a little bit? Yeah, the social stress and managing the fallout from that is actually really important too. Um, and so we, we know from experience and from, from actual plenty of, plenty, plenty of research that um, typically social isolation, irritability, uh, anger, and all, all tend to increase during prep. Um, general mental stress goes up. If you were just to look at like something like a uh, profile of mood states and generally mood state gets better at first and then gets worse at a certain stage in prep, uh, getting better at first, just because you have more structure, uh, you know, you're not, you're not pushing a huge deficit. You're looking better. You're in better shape physiologically and that trickles down into how you act, but eventually it's going to cause problems. Um, and, you know, like we kind of have this archetype of the bro that we look down on in the evidence-based community of someone who uh, basically becomes a social hermit. But what I think we have to acknowledge is that's actually a coping strategy. Um, if I don't have to interact with people for the next three months, I don't have to worry about saying no to going out to eat. I don't have to worry about pissing off someone and maybe whether they realize it or not, they feel that the best option is just to not see anybody for three months. And that'll, that's the, that's the most damage control they can do. Um, however, I think if we can be conscious, we know that not maintaining a relationship with people for three months is also problematic in many cases, especially like if you're living with people. Um, and so there are, there, there's, there's a couple ways to tackle this, you know, some, some highly competitive, single-minded, um, outcome-focused bodybuilders have a tough time wrapping their heads around why it's not okay just to kind of socially isolate and and, and cut everyone out of the, out of their lives because you know, that's just what I got to do for this prep. You know, you got to sacrifice to win. And while that is true to some degree, that can cause stress that actually impacts your competitive outcome, even if it's not this season. It might be next. Um, because you're also blowing up your social support network and you're potentially creating stress later in life. You know, you might get a divorce or have 
uh, fallout with your family, and that creates stress. And if it creates stress in the middle of prep when you're less equipped to deal with it, that can affect the competitive outcome. Now, that's a very kind of like sociopathic way to, to describe that to bodybuilders because that assumes that the only thing that matters is how it affects prep. But I think if you were to really assess it when you weren't in the grip of I got to do everything I can to win, which we all get in as competitors, but looking at it when we take our take a step back and maybe think about this in the off season, we go, right, no, I don't want to destroy the relationships with my family uh, because I'm, I'm in prep brain mode. So then we have to think about, all right, so how do we – not create social stress and how do we not be stressed out by social activities and how do we essentially live through prep versus making uh, life stop for prep, right? So the degree to which this happens uh, is, you know, it, it's going to be different for everybody. But so for example, some of the things I do is that if I have a bunch of meetings in person uh, like, for example, with my PhD students or with, uh, you know, faculty members at AUT, um, that's probably going to be a refeed day. I will actually work my food schedule around my social interactions. Um, also, if I have a planned refeed coming up, but it's, let's say, it's a day where I'm going to be home alone, you know, my wife's out and maybe she's on a, a trip for her geology classes where she's going to be away for the weekend and I've got no plans, you better believe those are going to be I'm going to push those low days. I'm going to do a cardio session that, that might have not been planned. I'm going to take advantage of that social space I have where the only person I'm going to piss off is me um, and just be irritable in my own head and get that deficit in, uh, grab those days up and have an auto-regulated uh, schedule of when I push deficit days and when I push refeeds based on what I have to do in my life. Because the... The, the alternative to that of where you have this rigid schedule that might actually conflict with your life can end up creating a greater total allostatic stress through social stress and then inhibit your ability to succeed and get on stage. So that's kind of one of those things where, again, we approach it with this very reductionist mindset where it's like, here's what I got to do for prep. And it's either going to make life suck or I'm going to have to make my life orbit around it or I'm going to change my life. I mean, I know people who take three weeks off their job for the last couple mm. weeks when they compete. Like, they, they save up vacation days. Um, I know people who uh, force their families to eat differently during prep. Uh, I know people who don't eat out for the entire six months and skip their birthday, skip the holidays and all those things um, because they don't have a dimmer switch. They have an on and off switch, mm. right? They don't have the... Um, the tools or the awareness that it's even okay or possible or allowed uh, or they're just afraid of manipulating their plan around life and making it integrate with life rather than just kind of seeing them as these two separate things that when they clash, it's bad and you just got to put your head down or, or avoid clashes altogether. So I think it's basically giving a competitor more tools, which is where from a coach's perspective, that's where the mentorship comes in, like teaching your athlete how to handle dieting through the holidays teaching your athlete uh, how to communicate to their lo your loved ones about this or providing the the allowance for a schedule where someone has diet breaks or refeeds around vacations or work or what have you. Um, some of the lowest hanging fruit where I, I saw the need for this was when I had uh, a, a bodybuilder I've coached a couple times who was going through med school and we would take deloads and not weigh in and take a diet break during uh, exams because mm -hmm. the wheels would all fall off. It just wouldn't go well. So let's, let's not do that. Um, or learning the hard way, uh, having clients talk me into dieting during a holiday and going, no, I can stay on track. I, I found, I found the, 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 the grocery store. I found, I found the, the, the gyms. It's going to be all good. And sometimes they do fine. But uh, nine times out of 10, it ends up being at the very least a lost week of dieting. Mm -hmm. And instead I go, right, let's, let's have that be a preemptive diet break. And all I want you to do is hit calories. Don't worry about protein. Just eyeball it. Uh, instead of setting them up for failure and then turning into binging, worst case, they're just not estimating calories right. And they're in a, you know, a 300 calorie surplus when we meant them to be at, at maintenance instead of being in a 3000 calorie surplus because they binged all day, you know? So things like that are, um, end up being very useful tools. So assessing the potential places where life will conflict with prep if done in a, in a very static, rigid way 
And then instead thinking, all right, well, how can I integrate this? Mm -hmm. um, when would I take my diet break? Can I have an auto-regulated schedule of, of low days and high days? So for example, maybe I push low days uh, until I see progress and then that, that triggers a number of high days. Or my high days come based on my, my work schedule. Uh, and, and that's fine. You know, and th there's, there's many ways to do it. And again, it looks individual like we talked about. Um, but attending to it in that way makes the whole process less stressful, which can make you, your ability to, to diet longer or diet harder uh, the reality. And then you can get into better shape. Yeah, man, that's awesome. And there's a lot of nuggets there for anyone who's looking to prep. And I think a lot of competitors, as you mentioned, do put the blinkers on during a prep as a coping mechanism because they're just so afraid to let anything else outside of prep sort of be a focus point. And I've seen this a lot with um, our competitors. They will start, you know, creating group chats and contacting each other and er everything's about prep. And I think sometimes the more able you are to keep your eggs dispersed across many baskets, um, yeah, you just keep all of the wheels in your life turning so that not only when prep finishes do you come out in a better place, but it can often just cause less problems. Things don't start coming undone, which can be a bigger stress. And yeah, if you're in, uh, you know, digging deep towards the back end of the prep, you're not in a position to be able to tolerate, you know, those kind of uh, big life issues like losing your job, having relationships break down or all that sort of stuff. And I guess the, the final component um, of uh, the questions I wanted to ask anyway was what are the actionable strategies that athletes can use to prevent, uh, manage, and I guess uh, enhance their ability to tolerate stress? For example, uh, you know, altering their perception of stress. What are some things that athletes can do uh, to, you know, help improve that? Uh, what are some ways they can improve their uh, recovery outside of the gym so they can tolerate more stress, uh, all those sorts of things? Yeah, good questions. And um, some of this work is actually need to be done in advance in the off season. Mm. So um, starting in the right position, I think, is critical. So, for example, finding that sweet spot, which does change over time because there's a big behavioral component to where you're the leanest you can start prep with feeling zero diet fatigue. So, cause you don't want to start a diet feeling stressed from dieting. Um, and to use myself as a case study, um, this has come down about two to three kilos each time I've prepped. So I started this last prep, um, in this mid December, December 18th, I was 88, 89, uh, I think. And, uh, with my lowest gnarly weigh in probably needing to be around 80, 81 to be in, in like, like sh crazy shredded shape. Um, and that wasn't a possibility for, for me before, cause I didn't have the nutritional behavioral components in place that were automatic. Um, and I would have felt restricted to, to keep myself at that point. Um, but I did do too many cuts in, in 2018 to get there and then brought myself back up to maintenance and, and felt like I was just living life at, at 80, 89 and started prep. So that's, that's really important. Um, the behavioral side of it on the nutrition is very important as well. The, I've written a couple blog posts about this lately at 3DMJ where the closer you can get, um, the, what your life looks like from the outside, uh, during prep and the off season, uh, to one another, the, the better position you're going to be in to transition. Um, both on the front end and back end of prep. Uh, not that the deficit is gone, not that you're in a surplus or not that you're not, not doing cardio. Like the quantitative variables are quite different. You're going to be eating more food, um, doing less cardio, not in a deficit. You know, one's gaining muscle, one's losing fat and trying to hold on to muscle. Yeah, they're definitely different. But if your meal structure looks the same, if the kind of, uh, components to each meal fall into the same general categories, but the portion size is, is different or more meals have a, have a, have a carb or a fat in them, et cetera. I think then it becomes very easy to have this plug and play automatic structure where there's less decisions to be made. And mm -hmm. if you build those skills in the off season, 
it's a easier to start lean because it, you just do the same thing and modify things until you're not hungry and not experiencing food focus and that's the leanest you can be great okay that's where you start um but the the changes you make to your diet are, are so minuscule you know you swap out higher calorie fruits for lower calorie fruits and uh, full fat dairy for low fat dairy and less lean cuts of meat for leaner cuts of meat. Um, reduce the portion sizes of, of starchy carbs or replace them with veggies and boom, all of a sudden uh, you're basically doing the same thing, but you're eating a whole lot less calories. Um, other things you can do is to assess, essentially with, with, with training, the goal is how do I make my training just as effective from a hypertrophy stimulus standpoint while being subjectively easier? So playing with set and rep structures is something I've done a lot with. What exercises and what rep and load and, and RPE do I experience subjectively is the easiest? And this is different for different movements and different for different people, uh, depending on their like anaerobic, aerobic capacity, uh, range of motion they have to go through, prior joint pain. So for example, I find doing more sets in the four to six rep range on a heavy compound lower body movement is easier than doing say three sets of 10. Like if I'm going to put a squat bar on my back, I would rather do five by five at, you know, 75, 80, 80% 80 of one RM than doing uh, three by 10 with that same load or three by eight or the equivalent number of reps, same load, but different RPE, right? Um, so playing with, uh, your splits, um, a good example for me is leg day, like having a leg day in prep at certain points is brutal. The idea of doing squat, RDL, leg press, leg extension, leg curl, calf raises for three to five sets each when you are, when you have striated glutes and you're eating, you know, 10 K cows per pound, that can be such a daunting day. Uh, that it, it, the, the, the drive to the gym can be stressful <laughs> just thinking about it, you know? Um, however, I found personally, and I don't recommend this for everyone. This has more to do with my individual volume needs for different body parts that doing like a single leg movement on, on every, every day and splitting up my leg days so that at most I'm doing one to two leg movements a day. That is way more easy for me to do. And then it allows me, it doesn't eat into my, my upper body volume. So I actually train full body during prep um, to where I'm doing like a leg press or a hack squat or a RDL. Uh, and then, you know, sprinkling in some accessories as well. And my, my days are largely uh, a bunch of upper body movements and one to two lower body movements. And I find that is much more easy for me to get the same equivalent volume as I do in the off season, maybe slightly less, um, and maintain it through prep without feeling mm -hmm. as subjectively beat up, which means that I'm more likely to hold on to muscle mass. So th th those are some of the things where you're not actually changing the X's and O's of volume or intensity, but the distribution mm -hmm. to alter your subjective experience, to lower your total allostatic load so you can keep training hard, um, setting yourself up in the right position, establishing the behaviors in the off season to set you up during prep. Um, and then the other thing, things I've mentioned, uh, thinking about the appropriate level of tracking for your personality experience level. Um, and, and then implementing things like, uh, diet breaks and refeeds, which are in and of themselves helpful for managing stress. But also if you consider how they interact with your life variables, uh, they can be even more so. So those are kind of the collective strategies, uh, that, that I'll be presenting on at the UEBC in June. Um, that, that result in having a less stressful total prep, but there's are, there are others, for example, uh, sleep, uh, is a pretty important part of prep, um, because it typically falls under one, one or two categories with people at a certain point, they want to sleep all the time. Um, and they're always tired or, uh, they're tired, but they can't sleep. Uh, they can't sleep for more than say four hours at a time and pop awake in the middle of the night. So doing things related to taking naps. Uh, improving sleep hygiene, um, and you know, thinking about uh, what types of meal structures can we maybe eat more food right before bed? Does that improve your sleep, or does that cause problems? And experimenting with some of those strategies. Um, most of the time, people find just man, they sleep better on refeeds and diet breaks. Like just eating more allows them to sleep. So uh, that, that's what's the one thing you can't fix. But if you look at everything else, sometimes you can. You can you can maintain your 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 sleep quality or get in naps 
um, to make sure that you're actually recovering. So that that's it's a, it's a broad range of stuff, um, but it's it's some of the most important stuff that we don't think mm. about in terms of what's just the broad volume recommendation. How big should my deficit be? How many? What what are my macronutrient breakdown? And how many pounds a week should I be losing? Those are important, but they're not all of it for sure. Yeah, awesome, man. And I guess the other point of discussion that's that's worth having is just how dieting uh, affects our recovery and fatigue in a more broad sense um, because we've sort of we've spoken about what it is and yeah you know, we know that mm-hmm. prep gets hard um, but run us through what you've been experiencing um, you know in the last few weeks as things have gotten really really uh, challenging in the lead up to your final show I presume that it would have been more difficult than at the start of the prep. Um, yeah, how did that just affect you overall? Yeah, so I can definitely speak to my personal experience here. So, um, yeah, early on, I, I was starting with no cardio, and I was running five days that, again, I wasn't necessarily tracking in the beginning, but I can't not know what I was taking in. Um on average, about 1,800 calories on my low days, and then followed by two high days around 2,500 calories-ish, uh, running no cardio. And I was dropping quick. I was dropping about a 1% of my body weight per week. And um, as I began to plateau, the first thing I did, took a ref- I took a diet break. So I had seven days in a row right around 2,500 calories-ish. And then I came back to it, and I was able to progress for about a week before then I, I started to hit that stall again. And then I just shifted to uh, adding a couple of cardio sessions. And then the week after that, to keep the pace, I started dropping my calories down closer to 1,600, 1,700. Um, As I got to the point, I think I was six weeks out, that's when I started having more closer contact with Birdo, um, where I could tell that uh, I was less likely to make the right decisions. Uh, So for example, um, I was in Gold Coast and, uh, because I felt, you know, I'd been a little plateaued and I need to keep the pace up. Uh, I was reporting to Birdo and I said, Hey man, just did my second, second day of refeeding and I'm going to go back into my series of low days, you know, losses are going, going well. I'm, I'm losing a good clip. And he said, you look flat as shit, man. And I was like, I do. And then I thought about it and I looked at it and I was like, yeah, I do. But I was more focused and excited by the fact that I hadn't gained weight on my refeed, mm. you know, like, oh, sweet, I'm going to get some new veins. This is going to be a really good productive fat loss week. And Berto kind of reminded me like, hey, bro, like refeeds have a purpose and, and you know, fat loss isn't it. You know, it's, it's, it's setting you up for, for muscle maintenance and good performance in the gym and, uh, and actually getting your glycogen levels up. And that, that hasn't occurred to the degree that it should after two, two days of supposed refeeding. So at that point, Berto made a decision that maybe I would have if I'd been a little less uh, fat loss focused of adding a third refeed day. So that's when he went to a 4-3 schedule, um, and that worked for a good bit, improved things, and then eventually I had to keep my, my calories lower on my four low days. Um, and this was right around the time, I think right around six weeks out, where I started to notice that successive low days uh, when I was 84, 83 kilos – felt a lot different than successive low days when I was 88 kilos. And this is where I think there's really some interesting uh, future research to be done. Because right now we think so much of it is ascribed to energy availability. You know, like how big is your deficit relative to, to what you have to do in terms of energy expenditure. And that's what's going to cause, you know, menstrual cycle disruption, drops in testosterone, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But um, that's definitely modified by body fat percentage. Like we also have data showing you put obese people into a deficit, men's testosterone levels don't change. You put a lean person into a deficit, testosterone levels drop. So I started to feel a lot more lethargic, irritable, and hungry when I'd been on successive low days uh, when I was lighter and leaner uh, than when I was heavier. Uh, so I was much less robust in terms of my ability to handle uh, those low days. Um, so I had to make a few training adjustments. And this is another place where I could speak to things that should be just as effective but might be subjectively easier to experience. So when I do a a front squat, for example, I have a lot of things mentally going on, even though I've pretty well ingrained that movement pattern. I have to think about driving my elbows up, keeping my back tight, uh, initiating by feeling like I'm starting with my knees moving forward, 
um, going down low enough and not so low that I lose my, my lumbar position. And then as I drive up, not letting my hip, my hips shift backwards. So I have to pay attention a lot. And there's a lot of mental energy that goes into doing heavy front squats, uh, that are, are, are near to a 10 RPE, right? However, a hack squat or like a power squat or a leg press takes a lot less. So I wouldn't necessarily drop my volume, but I slowly started to get rid of certain movements. Um, so I, I swapped out uh, deadlifts from the floor for RDLs. And then um, one of my RDL days became, uh, for, well, well, it's not, not one of my days, but sometimes instead of RDLs, I would do a weighted back extension. Uh, and then my front squats became a hack squat uh, and uh, a number of movements that were mentally draining, I replaced with machine or plate loaded variants, but kept the same volume. And that made the sessions feel easier, even though you'd think it, it, sh it should provide a similar stimulus. I'm sure it's slightly different, but I think for all intents and purposes, that was a worthwhile trade off in terms of the subjective lowering of difficulty while still keeping a relatively similar volume per body part. So anyway, um, that's another example of things that I did deeper into prep. Um, and so, yeah, the, the experience of going lower calories and having successive low days when I'm leaner is certainly harder. It was not brutal. This is still the easiest prep I've ever had. Um, and it's, it's definitely hard. It's still contest prep, but I've been, really surprised by how well this prep has gone. Let's put it that way. Um, and I did have to dig at the end, you know, like when that April 6th comp was coming up, um, and knowing that I was, I was what we, we describe at 3DMJ as legally shredded and meaning that I've got glutes from the side, uh, I've got hamstring splits, I've got quad separation, I'm lean everywhere. And I've got a couple of cuts in my glutes from the back. One would say that I had striated glutes, but they weren't like top to bottom, you know, Brian well, Whitaker. Bad. Yeah, exactly. I didn't quite yet have walnut butt. Um, or as I like to say, my, my butt did not yet look like a rib cage. So, um, so yeah, I could be leaner. Is, is it, no one would say I didn't show up in shape, but people would say, hey, if you want to improve, you get a little tighter. Um, so, um, so yeah, I've got more work to do, but I, we're talking maybe a kilo, I think, of fat loss at this stage. Uh, and I've got, you know, 10 weeks to do it before my first show. So I've got plenty of time. So it's a question of at what point will I start eating up? And how hard will I dig to get there now? But yeah, so it did get difficult. Um, I think the hardest streak I did to make sure we were in shape on time was I ran four days at around 1,400 calories. Had one day at 1,900 because I had meetings. That was an impromptu refeed. Mm -hmm. Berto wanted seven days in a row based on the visual progress. And I said, hey, I'll give you eight days in a row if you let one of them be a, a, a moderate day just so I can survive this day of meetings. And then I did another three after that 1900 day at 1400. Um, and that produced some really good progress. I was disgustingly flat and training wasn't going great, mm -hmm. um, but it was worth it because it got me into good shape. Uh, and then I, I ran my three 2700 days. Um, and then I think at that point we were two weeks out. And then it, we tested my peak week, the, the two weeks out. And then we, that worked quite well, modified a little bit, and I got on stage. Um, and my peak weeks aren't aggressive, so it was still a fat loss week. It was essentially restructuring that 4-3 into placing those refeeds to where they made me look my best on game day. So that was kind of the, the last few uh, weeks going into prep. And the hardest it got was those uh, eight days of, of being on 1,400 or one day at 1,900 calories. And that was, that was pretty – that was, wasn't, wasn't too fun, but it was, um, it was doable. Man, very, very cool. That was a very insightful discussion and awesome to hear you talk about, I guess, some of the taboo uh, mm. areas related to contest prep. Not that they're taboo. We all, we all talk about how much prep sucks and whatnot, but I just think it's done so through a very pessimistic and often at times yeah, complaining lens. Um, you know, People mm. just like talk about it, but we don't actually... Uh, discuss it with um, the intentions of understanding it better and having uh, ways to work through it and be smarter about how we approach things. But thank you very much for your time, Eric. All the best in the upcoming weeks before your shows in 
July. I was going to say May again. I don't know why I was going to do that. <laughs> um, but yeah, and guys, Eric will be at the UABC June 28th to the 30th with a bunch of other fitness professionals uh, talking all things nutrition, training. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of different topics being covered. So if you are in Melbourne or you want to come down and check it out, there will be uh, tickets available. Link for those is in the description box below. And be sure to check out Eric, the guys at 3DMJ. They put out a lot of good content, uh, plenty of articles coming from Eric the last couple of months. And yeah, also check out Mass, uh, monthly applications in strength sports. They do some really good work there. I'm a very big fan of uh, their research view. So if you haven't already subscribed, you can do so through the link in the description box. But Eric, we'll speak to you soon, man. Anything uh, else you've got coming on or coming up in the near future? Man, I'm, I'm excited for the UEBC. I'll be uh, literally one week out from my... Uh... My, my my next show there so you'll get to see me looking like skeletor it'll be fun times <laughs> that'd be very cool and thank you for having me on just uh always fun to fun to chat with you man my pleasure bro thank you for your time eric we'll speak to you next time bro thank you again appreciate it